Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Streckman, and I'm a librarian in the Programming and Learning Department at the Vancouver Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome also to anyone who's tuning in on Facebook Live. This event will be available for viewing afterwards on BPL Facebook. So if you have any friends or family that missed the event and want to see it, you can direct them there. Kung Day, Bob Baker, and I are coming to you live from the central branch of BPL, located on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Tonight, we are focusing on the art, strength, and color, culture of the Squamish peoples. And I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Jorge, who is helping you out in the chat. He is going to put a link to the Squamish Nation's website where you can read more after the program. And I would encourage you all to learn all that you can about this vibrant and dynamic Coast Salish nation. Speaking of the chat, please don't be shy about using it tonight to express yourself and comment throughout the event. If you have a question throughout the discussion, please ask it in the chat and we will do our best to answer it. A quick reminder that you'll want to make sure you're sending your messages to both audience and panelists. So make sure that you don't have it set to panelists only. And Jorge will repeat this in the chat if you have any questions. If you feel like you need to communicate something only to VPL staff, that's okay too. And you can select only the panelists and uh, send us a message. A last note, when using the chat, please be kind. We're all getting used to connecting online, so be thoughtful with your words. It is now my honor and delight to introduce Kung Day to kick off our conversation about canoeing culture. She is the 2021 Indigenous Storyteller in Residence at Vancouver Public Library and a truly wonderful human being. Kung Day, would you like to come join me on stage? Hello there. The Lung Wadlawan Ashke Lagan. I thank each and every one of you for being here. The Lung Kenge Ash Andi Hangelga. It's good to see you all. The Lung Katskit La Oslan. You all look really good. Gashlinge Uitzang. It's a true story. Hi, you all. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so honored to be uh, 2021's Indigenous Storyteller in Residence. Oh, and I wanted to ask you all a question. You might not be able to answer, but I'll ask you. You could answer at home, I guess. Gesinu ayet dalang eidang. How are you all doing today? Ayet diu gudenge lagang. I am happy today. I'm happy today. So, um, Kung Jade Hinu Had Kishkadi Kyang. My Haida name is Moon Woman. Yakulana Stud Diaskagang. I'm from the Yakulanas Raven Clan. Diu Au Hadagang. I'm a Masset Haida, but I'm also Squamish and Musqueam. And I wanted to share a little bit of. Um, of my experience with canoes, but I also want to give a little bit of history from, um, from what I know. So all of my ancestors on both sides of my ancestry, or all sides of my ancestry, I'm sorry, uh, traveled in canoes. Uh, all of my ancestors were ocean going people because the ocean was our highway. So there were different, different kinds of canoes that they would have traveled in or used. So they had smaller river canoes to uh, travel in rivers. They had much, much bigger ocean canoes. And they had war canoes. They had hunting canoes and fishing canoes as well. They had small canoes for one person or two people. And um, they had very, very large canoes as well. So the Haida ancestors uh, were known for traveling uh, as far as Mexico and California, but also Japan and Hawaii. So there is a story that I learned about from taking a Haida language class where the Haida ancestors in one of the villages on Haida Gwaii decided to 
uh, go on a very long journey. They made it all the way to Hawaii. It took two months to get there. And when they got there, when they arrived, uh, the Hawaiian ancestors greeted them warmly and welcomed them to their territory. And they had a feast for them that, that evening and there was singing, there was dancing and um, the Haida ancestors and the Hawaiian ancestors uh, uh, got together and they traded items with one another to cement their friendship with each other. And so they rested there for a very long time and they really got to know each other. But after a while, some of the Haida ancestors grew homesick and they longed to return to their, their village on Haida Gwaii. And so the Hawaiians uh, helped them with the provisions, with the water, uh, with everything that they needed so that they would not need anything for their journey back home. Some of the Haida ancestors made the decision to stay in Hawaii. And so there are descendants today from those ancestors that's still living there. Well, the Haida started on their journey and the day was beautiful. It, the water was calm, but as they got out to sea, a storm came up and thankfully everyone managed to stay in the canoes, but they lost all their food. They lost their paddles. They even lost their water and they gave up. They gave up and they felt very, very sad at not getting the opportunity to return to their village to see their families. It broke their hearts. And as they just laid in the canoe, their canoes waiting for the end, a pod of sana, of killer whales, happened to be swimming right close to them. And they decided to check them out to see what was going on. After a short time, the sana, the killer whales, discovered what had happened. And what happened next was they decided to help these Haida. So the killer whales went underneath their canoes and lifted them on the top of their heads and they swam all the way to their village and they brought them home. They brought them to their exact village. And so the loved ones waiting in the village were astonished to see that these, these killer whales had brought their own loved ones back home to them. They were, they were completely flabbergasted, but they were most grateful that their loved ones returned completely unharmed. So what the villagers decided to do is they led the killer whales into their freshwater stream where they filled buckets and they gave the kill killer whales water to drink. Now, the most amazing thing about, about this uh, experience is this relationship continued for many, many years between the villagers and the killer whales. Every time the killer whales came, they were heading towards that stream and the villagers went to the stream and they filled those buckets and they gave the killer whales as much fresh water that they wanted to drink. So what I wanna do is I want to sing the ambitious paddle song. This is something that, um, that my, my relatives do today. When we're in a canoe, we sing to keep the other paddlers on the same stroke. It's very important because if everyone's paddling at a different pace, no one is gonna get anywhere. So the other part that I believe with the paddle songs, the canoe journey can be very 
tough. It can be strenuous. It could be, it could reach the point where the person or some of the people might want to give up. But I believe that the singing actually helps to give the paddler strength to continue paddling a little longer as they sing the songs with the drummer, with the singer. Well, I will come out of the street. I usually stand, so I will sit. <laughs> Who? Thank you for listening. I was going to mention when you hear me, heard me saying hoop the hoy, that means paddles up. So when we're in the canoe, uh, there are many reasons. Um, there are many reasons for putting your paddles up. Sometimes it means that the canoe is coming into land, so the paddles have to come up, the canoe has to slow down. Maybe there's there are some rocks. Uh, nearby and uh, they have to stop and they have to turn a different way or maybe they have to change position and this is something that I had to learn when I was in my Uncle Bob's canoe uh, how to change position safely and carefully I had to really listen to Uncle Bob so I sat as close to him as possible <laughs> um, anyways I have my own experience a paddling on long canoe journey, but uh, actually it wasn't a canoe, it was in a kayak. In August 2009 and 2010, uh, each year I paddled 200 kilometers in Guayanas. That was um, two weeks long. So Guayanas is the most southern part of Haida Gwaii. Uh, it is a national park. And I, I must say, I learned that paddling can be very challenging. I do remember on the second canoe journey in 2010 that there were Tajue uh, Klotska. Uh, there were very strong winds. So the first day uh, we were paddling uh, four hours straight. And so in a kayak, there is a paddle on each end. So it was um, sort of moving back and forth. And when we rested, so I was traveling with a friend. When we rested, we discovered that we went back further and further from where we had started. So we had to continuously paddle for four hours without, without stopping because there was no place to land. And the second day, it was six hours of paddling nonstop. And the third day was nine. Nine hours of paddling nonstop without a break. So I had some pretty good arms by the end of that. But I really enjoyed it. So in Guayanas, I got to paddle to the southern ancient villages. There are um, northern villages as well, but I got to paddle to the southern villages 
And as I paddled into these villages, I would sing either a paddle song or I would sing a song that would come to me to, uh, to, to let the watchmen, which are sometimes women as well, know that I am a Haida and I was coming into this village to visit. Um, one of the things that I, I got to experience that I totally will never ever forget as long as I live, I got to paddle to a thousand year old Sitka spruce. This Sitka spruce is so tall, it's a thousand years old and it's still growing in our world. And the first two years that I got to see it, I could not see the crown. I could not see the top of it. It's so big. The first branch is many, 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 many meters off the ground. And it's so big around that it looks like the base of another tree. I could see the markings on the side of it where a black bear climb climbs it every day to sleep on that first branch in the sun. I discovered that it takes 13 adults to hold hands around the base of the tree. That's how big around it is on the bottom. This tree is so magnificent. It feels like it's my friend because I got to visit again, it again a third time when I was storyteller in residence in Guayanas, I visited that tree and I spoke to it in my language in Hadkil. And I talked about how good it was to see it again. I asked it how it was doing. I told it how I was doing. I was so very happy. I told it that I love it because I do. And I am so grateful that year, I actually got to see the crown for the first time, but sadly it's because there was a very big storm that winter and it blew all the younger trees down around it. So it was kind of a mess because the trees were all over the place, but at the same time, this Sitka spruce is standing all by itself uh, and it's absolutely magnificent. I am thinking that it's important for us to make these connections in this time, especially during this pandemic, to make a connection with a tree. Now, it might sound funny to you, but for a long time, I could only hug myself. But a friend reminded me that I can hug trees as well. So once in a while, I find a tree and I will hug it because I need to feel this connection to our earth. I need to remind myself and get out of my head because I can get very stressed out at this time that we're in. It will not last forever. Dear people, we will have our lives again while well, you're alive now. The other one last thing I wanted to share about being in Guayanas, that first year that I was paddling there I saw a sight so beautiful. I saw the circle of life, how everything was connected. I saw the clouds in the sky and the sun. I, I saw the rain and I saw all this connected to the beautiful evergreen trees. The forests are magnificent and so richly green. And I saw the, for, the trees uh, standing on the very soft and rich moss. And then I saw the beaches full of rocks and sometimes sand and seaweed, but also sometimes the black bears were turning over those rocks and eating the little crabs that are underneath. I saw the deer on the shore, but then I saw the ocean and the seals and the sea lions making their loud noises. I saw many seabirds, but my favorite of those were the tufted puffins because they turned their heads this way and that with their little tufts wiggling back and forth. It, they were so cute. I saw underneath the sea with the giant bull kelp and very, very long, the huge kelp fields are beds that go on as far as my eyes could see. I could see even in Burnaby Narrows the uh, sea stars 
and the bad stars in a rainbow of colors. I saw the sea urchins and the moon snails. I saw the clams and I saw river otters. I didn't get to see sea otters. I was really hoping and hoping, but I did not get to see them. As I looked and I saw this perfect circle and how everything is connected and it was so shiny and when it was so bright, I had to close my eyes because I was amazed at what a beautiful world we live in. It's beautiful everywhere. I can see beauty every single day. And I can feel this connection right here in this big city as well. The power of our earth and the power of those beautiful trees that give us oxygen every day. I am so grateful today that I get this opportunity to spend with all of you, but also with my wonderful uncle, Bob Baker. I gotta tell you a funny story about him first because he's not on stage with me yet, but it took him a long time to accept me as his niece. <laughs> he just didn't, maybe it's my gray hair, I don't know. He, maybe he thought, I can't have a niece this old, but he finally accepted me last summer. I'm so grateful, Uncle, that you are here and you can share your knowledge about canoe culture. Haichka, how ah, OCM, Chen Kwan Mantomi. Okay, Uncle. No hot Malay, Chesha Sta Chesiam, and Slay Quin Se Quin Toma Tane Mistama, and Slay Quin Se Quin Chuk Mahat, Tan Kwashaman, Saapalak, Stomach Sna. Thank you, Eunice, for that wonderful introduction. And um, yeah, I'm finding it easier to say the word now, Nice. And um, very happy for your journey here with the Vancouver Library. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your um, time and um, to introduce myself from the beginning, following uh, what we call Chiach, Tan Kushaman Saapalak Stomach Sna. My ancestral name is Saapalak, uh, Lanakila Kanaka Sna. I also carry a Lanakila, uh, Hawaiian name. I had um, the great pleasure of living in Hawaii for 16 years and uh, being a part of um, the community over there, having been hanaid or adopted by um, a Hawaiian family uh, when I first went to Hawaii to um, just to hang out, um, Auntie Genoa Keawe, the family from up in um, Papakalea on the island of Oahu. And then I had uh, the, the awesome experience of um, being involved with community, being involved with uh, canoes in Hawaii, um, sailing canoes, outriggers, surfing canoes, uh, voyaging canoes, and um, consequently, um, that is kind of what kept me, kept me sane the ocean. We are water people, as uh, Gung Jade mentioned, that we are um, 
we have salt water in our veins. We are, um, we are very uh, connected to the ocean and everything the ocean provides, uh, provides us with an energy, provides us with a, a way of uh, strengthening ourselves, strengthening our spirits and a way to conduct ourselves through life. Chiach is uh, one of our favorite words when we are involved with um, meeting new people. <clears throat> and uh, Chiach translates to protocol, translates to law. So our protocol determines um, how we're going to conduct ourselves, how we're going to carry ourselves when we are engaged with another community in the sense of um, demonstrating, uh, demonstrating respect, demonstrating uh, who we are and um, the protocols of bringing a canoe into someone else's territory. All of these things uh, were uh, revived during our preparation to go to Bella Bella in the year 1993 uh, when I'd come back from Hawaii in 1990, I noticed that um, there weren't too many people that were getting involved with uh, our canoe culture. So I had um, taken that um, incentive to, to push ahead to find, to find a tree, to find a log, to find uh, carvers that were able to uh, create uh, ocean going canoes. As was mentioned by Gung Jere that uh, we have um, all kinds of canoes and um, actually I brought a couple that I can show you. We have racing canoes, war canoes, Kukult, the uh, seagoing canoes. We have um, women's canoes for when they're out gathering and uh, when they're you know, doing uh, their, their thing out in the the rivers and uh, the berry fields with the canoes. We also have uh, fishing canoes, doubles, singles, six man, 11 man. And this here, first canoe is a, this is fashioned after an ocean going canoe. Our word for this is kukul. And um, it, is a, um, it is a canoe that was used for long distance travel. It was uh, shaped for comfort rather than speed. And uh, this is a model of a, of a racing canoe. And this racing canoe is built to catch the enemy, to chase down anything that uh, is trying to get away. Or if we're trying to get away ourselves, we're gonna make a good getaway. So the um, Coast, Coast Salish nations First Nations around uh, the uh, Vancouver Island South and uh, Seattle, down as far as Seattle, Oregon, and throughout here in the Fraser Valley, we are known as the Coast Salish. And uh, because of the language, the dialect that we speak, the Squamish Nation is a uh, part of a bigger family um, that uh, we call the Mish family, um, going as far south as Oregon. Uh, which caused us to, you know, go and visit our relatives later on with our with our canoes. The um, other nations would be like Skokomish, Suquamish, Stamish, Swinomish. They all end with Mish, which is in reference to. Um, I've been told the uh, the Mish part of the name is in reference to the North Wind. And we have been here for a long time. We have been here for, according to the archaeologists, about 14,000 years. That's a long time to develop and, um, you know, create better canoes. While in Hawaii, I had the opportunity of um, being involved with uh, Hawaiian um, outrigger canoes and uh, Hawaiian uh, sailing canoes, as well as surfing canoes and um, so I got involved with all that, with all of that culture, and consequently, having um, 
being involved with them, um, it led to being uh, introduced to some of the um, some of the paddlers, some of the sailors on the Hokalea, the uh, double hull voyaging canoe. And um, I never did get to sail on that canoe per se to to on a regular voyage, but I've I've been on that canoe a few times, just uh, around the islands, and those folks there with their style of uh, protocol, their style of demonstrating respect for whatever, for whoever they're visiting and uh, for their canoes, for their ancestors, for their immediate families, um, for their youth, for their elders, all of that uh, was um, experienced by myself and taken to heart that when I did um, finally come back to my home territory in the Hamilton area, Capilano, uh, North Vancouver, West Vancouver, the uh, village uh, that uh, we call Hamilton, which is known to the outside community as Capilano, IR number five. Uh, Capilano is actually a family name. Hamilton is the actual name of that area. Um, I had uh, brought back with me a lot of um, a lot of good experiences and teachings that are very similar to what we do. And upon getting back here, I found that uh, we needed to find a canoe. We needed to get involved with canoes. We needed to be involved with our our cousin nations that are starting to get active on the west coast. And uh, so, 1993 was the very beginning of it. So I had the opportunity of traveling uh, around with um, um, my friend, Frank Brown, who uh, challenged the West Coast to paddle their canoes from their villages to um, Waglisla, Bella Bella, and uh, to visit with the Heistuk and to enjoy, I think it was a five day uh, canoe gathering. And this was 1993. So, having um, that kind of um, incentive, that kind of uh, drive was, uh, was a very enjoyable experience because I had learned so much about our own culture that was kind of there but was sleeping. Um, I had originally been brought up uh, with the Squamish um, North End Canoe Club and learning the protocol and learning uh, what it is to be a part of a canoe team, a canoe family, that uh, the teachings are, for instance, um, when you are brought into a crew, a family, they don't expect you to contribute anything for at least four years. In other words, they expect you to be quiet for four years, to not, uh, to not um, always come up with um, a better way to run the canoe. When we're out on the water, uh, there are a lot of things that uh, come into come into our world, come into play. Being tired is one of them. But Gung Jare mentioned uh, the singing of songs, which um, lifts our spirits and uh, keeps us focused on the um, the purpose of why we're in that canoe and where we're going and also a way to demonstrate that we are a part of a bigger family. And we, we sing songs, we exercise protocol in the canoe that'll keep all our, we call it snomp. Snomp in the Squamish language means power and to keep our power in the canoe. When we are practicing, when we are preparing to go on a journey. We are thinking of things like how long we're gonna be in a canoe, um, how, how much we're gonna travel in one day, what kind of water is gonna be out there, big water, flat water, windy water, uh, rainy water, um, currents that could be against us, currents that'll be going you know, in our favor, uh, wind that could be in our favor, a lot of things to take into consideration when we're preparing and, and to actually, when we're on a journey, 
how we respond to any given situation that we find ourselves. There are times when uh, I've been in a canoe um, as, as the skipper, as the captain, and we've been in uh, big water, meaning that uh, the swells would be rolling around five, six, seven feet, and uh, we could have a cross, cross, uh, cross wind, and we could have rain. And one instance, we had all of those elements going, and uh, I was watching the canoe actually twisting and turning as it was going through the um, through the waves and through the swells for about uh, for about an hour and a half we had to we had to fight that water um, but it uh, it taught us a lot about ourselves about our canoe and the things that our ancestors experienced when they were you know when they were on the water which brings me to this place where um, I like to share about uh, what it is that we experience when we're on the water. We have that opportunity to see through our ancestors' eyes. We have the opportunity to, to experience, to appreciate what our ancestors were looking at when they're on the water. And uh, I hear stories about how they traveled. Uh, they traveled sometimes um, in great flotillas of a hundred canoes. They've traveled, uh, they like to travel sometimes at, uh, at midnight when it's, when everything's calm and uh, there's no, no big um, bad water to deal with. Then they would make runs to Vancouver Island or Vancouver Island would make runs to, to our longhouses over here during uh, ceremonial times, which is the winter time and uh, our families would come together, travel across the water, stay for about two or three weeks, and then they'd go back again. I have with I have a couple of paddles with me, you see behind me, and they are ocean going, ocean going canoe paddles. This one here, you can see has a sort of a wide blade and a narrow tip. The narrow tip is for the solid water uh, deeper down and uh, the fat part is for the surface water. The surface water is um, about uh, 10 inches, 12 inches on the surface and it is soft, very soft water. So we have the big blade for that, the wide part of the blade for that. And the narrow part is also used for pulling our way through uh, kelp, kelp beds beds of um, that will tell us what direction we're going but sometimes we we have no choice but to go across a um, seaweed uh, floating floating islands of kelp and uh, the narrow part of the blade helps us this other one is my steering paddle it's a six foot six foot yellow cedar paddle and uh, the design on it represents see if we can see it here represents um, eagle. Eagle is going for the North Star. So this is um, a navigational statement in that uh, we use the North Star as a marker, as our way of uh, knowing how to get home. So yeah, so navigation is a part of also that we need to take things into consideration on um, the full package of, of not only um, getting to the place, but we, we need to have experienced paddlers who are willing to learn about the current, currents, the different currents in the water, the back eddies, the best way to travel across water, the best way to harness the wind and um, the paddling techniques, paddling techniques that are, are used for for instance, choppy water and um, wind. If the wind is at our back or the wind is coming towards us, we hold our paddles a certain way. And uh, also the different kinds of strokes that we can use for, for river water, for if we're going against the current, um, there's, a, there's strokes that we can use for that. When we're going through the back eddies, when we're 
when we're just taking it easy on, on, on perfect ideal water, there are different strokes that we can use. So we need to practice those um, a couple of months before we get out there and um, we give ourselves to the elements, give ourselves to the water, the, um, which is um, a part of our uh, training is that transition, that uh, transformation that we need to do when we're going into a canoe, we need to leave the uh, land person on shore. We transform to a people of the water. We transform to a family of the water so that when we're on the water, we are, we are that family. We are not the same people as we were when we're on land. So that is part of our teachings. And so we need to grow that family together in harmony, learning the songs, learning the different paddling techniques, learning the correct way to sit and uh, learning how to maintain while we're in there, um, sometimes for hours on end. We don't know how far we're going to be traveling sometimes. And um, we will be surprised that when we get to about eight hours of paddling, that uh, 20 miles that we've covered is uh, not quite enough. We might need 10 more miles. So we'd have to be ready for that, be conditioned. So we, we create a, a canoe family that um, has that ability, has that conditioning and uh, are not afraid to, to keep going. We become a part of that canoe. We become a part of that family. And we have a saying, um, it's not the paddlers. It's not about the paddlers. It's about the canoe. It's the canoe that makes the journey. And it is up to us as paddlers to make sure that it gets there in the best way possible. So we don't have anything um, negative that uh, is going to is going to you know um, disturb the um, the harmony of the canoe. So we struggle and we we finally get to the place where we keep any negativity, any heaviness out of the canoe. That is part of the training and uh, part of the conditioning, part of the chiach the protocol, the laws of uh, how we are able to stay together in a canoe. When we're back on land, then we can go and do something, you know, whatever. But uh, while we're in the canoe, we are that family that has learned to be together. And uh, the purpose of our journey, the purpose of why we struggled so hard to uh, earn that seat in the canoe. So all of these things kind of um, come into play as we go through the day. Um, and then when we hit the wall, we about two or three hours into a paddle, we will uh, what they call hit, hit the wall. And we everything relies on instinct, relies on our training and our conditioning. So we sing songs to lift our spirits and we do not, uh, get involved in conversations that are gonna send our, our snump, our medicine, our power someplace else. We're gonna keep it in the canoe. So we, we find ways to do that. And one of those ways is by not getting into negative things. And if we find ourselves going that way, then we remind ourselves that it's not doing the crew, the family any good by you know, bringing negative stuff up because it just weighs the canoe down. So we, um, we kind of want to find positive ways to spend our day. And we're out there for on what we call um, tribal journeys or pulling together journeys. And um, our canoes are out there for a couple of weeks at a time, sometimes three weeks. And we are, we're in another world. We're in a world that doesn't have any any watches to push us around, any clocks. And I would like to say that all the corners have been taken off. We, we're living in a world that has a lot of circles. We see the day go, th we, uh, go by. We see uh, life, we see things happening on the ocean, the animals and the sea life, the eagles, they all become a part of um, our, our day 
our experience, therefore our family. And um, I brought a few photos along that I would like to share with you um, just to give you a glimpse of, of what our canoes look like and uh, maybe give you a hint of, you know, what it is that we do. That this photo is of our canoes and uh, the, the, we were at, at uh, White Rock at the time and we're getting ready to uh, paddle a little bit further and to into the village, but um, we were, they weren't ready for us. So we, we stashed our canoes on the beach and um, went into camp and got ready there, but just made for a nice picture. And this, uh, the canoe that's jutted out furthest with the, uh, with the red and uh, black paint is uh, Coquimpton. And this is uh, the canoes um, that are getting ready to um, come in and do protocol on the beach. And what we normally do is we ask the canoes to stand off and raft up according to nation and um, state our purpose for being in uh, the territory. This is uh, the Olympia, Washington area with uh, the Nisqually and uh, I think their Nisqually was hosting. Okay, the next one is, um, here's our crew from 1993 uh, that paddled to Bella Bella from uh, Ambleside. And um, all of these folks that are in the canoe now, every one of them has become an artist, has become fully involved in uh, culture, language, making canoes, everything to do with culture. Every one of these folks that are in, the, that are in this first crew have um, developed into artists. And uh, this is uh, from, this is myself and a couple of our paddlers that um, were doing uh, a bit of a welcome song for the Waglisla at Bella Bella. This is an interesting one I thought I'd throw in here and it's uh, of, a, uh, of a wave eater style canoe. And uh, you see that uh, it's got a pretty low draft on it. And that's because of, um, we got like six foot five people inside the canoe. And uh, this was in Flensburg, Germany, where we had been um, brought over, the canoe was brought over and we uh, conducted a a blessing ceremony to bless the BC ferries in Flensburg that were made uh, just before the Olympics. And uh, I thought I'd throw this one in there. That was a, that was a hilarious time. We had, um, we didn't have those paddles until the night before. And as you see, the water is, is uh, pretty close to the edge of the, the rail there. And you see the, the, the chief, the, the woman, the lady in the back just in sitting in front of me is scattering uh, eagle down on the water, and that in turn blesses the boats. And here we are in 2009 with uh, my crew that came up from Hawaii. And um, some of these guys are uh, Hokulea sailors, and they have just recently um, circumnavigated the planet using a system called wayfinding, uh, an old Polynesian navigation system. So the uh, couple of the folks in here are sailors and navigators for the, uh, for the Hokulea, the Hawaiiloa, uh, Hikianalia, and those canoes, uh, double hull canoes. So here we are entering um, Tulalip. And we were, because the Hawaiians were from far away, we were the first canoe to, to go in, which is a good thing because we, uh, we didn't have to wait uh, through the protocol for about three hours to, um, for them to get to us. We had by this point in a journey, we had about uh, 65 canoes had made it to this point. We were on our way to Suquamish on the island of Bainbridge. And uh, we still had a little bit ways to go, but this is uh, typical of uh, one of our landings 
going in to, um, to um, say hello to the Tulalip and the Swinomish. Uh, as you see in the back, you see the Hawaiian flag flying off the back of the canoe. Again, uh, protocol, this is our welcoming protocol with the, um, the Campbell River. I think they're called a Weiwekai and um, their longhouse, uh, their protocol is um, they do their thing first and uh, then we're allowed to conduct our business. So this uh, also an interesting um, educational thing when we're on a journey to learn how the protocol is going to go. This particular shot, I couldn't resist. I had a few more uh, with some of the other dancers and some of the other masks, but uh, this one here is of, um, of a headhunter and um, is uh, one of the mythical birds from back in, back in the day, back in time, that would hunt, uh, would hunt for human heads and uh, would swoop down and pluck them. But uh, yeah, so this is, thought I'd take a photo of that. And then here's our, our canoe, um, Coquempton, going through a riptide heading into uh, Victoria. <clears throat> this is of uh, the Nishka OBA celebration where we had been asked to take the floor so that uh, someone could ask us as the Squamish people, um, they asked us for permission to exercise their culture in Squamish territory, Tsleil-Waututh territory, Musqueam territory. They asked permission to do that. So that's what this shot is of um, Evan Stewart um, addressing our small group at that point. Um, a lot of this went on for a while with uh, Musqueam and uh, Tsleil-Waututh. We were the first ones up. And so we had, uh, we had the opportunity of, of demonstrating a little bit of uh, how we enjoyed the Nishka and their New Year's. On our journeys, we see things like this, uh, pictographs. In this particular pictograph, we believe it was from a time when the Kwakwakiwa and the Squamish uh, made peace through a marriage uh, potlatch uh, that uh, involved a chief's daughter from the Cape Mudge area and uh, one of our warriors, Pesamuk of the Squamish, who, um, who um, fell in love with uh, this uh, chief's daughter. They came in their canoes and dropped all their weapons in the water and they went ashore and potlatched uh, for about two weeks. It was about a two week long party. And so while the, the Kwakwakiwa were in our territory, we, we felt that, um, you know, they're part of the family now and we, we can't fight each other anymore. So we brought them around and uh, they had um, enjoyed the neighborhood doing a little bit of hunting, a little bit of fishing and a little bit of sightseeing and putting up pictographs here and there. Uh, this one here tells a bit of a story on um, the sign significance of our cultures coming together. We have to see it to be able to understand it. I can't really explain what it, what it's saying, and that's only my opinion. It could be it could mean something else. This is my dance group, Spakwa Slolom, and uh, we formed after the '93 uh, uh, journey to Bella Bella. We were asked to go to to um, to the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland to open the stage for a fellow by the name of Buck Owens. And then uh, I think their headliner was Natalie Cole, but they gave us, um, they gave us uh, three weeks in Montreux where we stayed at a motel. We had to work uh, three days a week and um, they covered the rest of it. Uh, it was a great trip in other words. The other photo is uh, of a canoe that is going to be saying hello to the water for the first time this year. It is, um, it has been named. It has a small naming ceremony. The name is uh, Tal Tewit, 
Tel Tewit. Tel Tewit. And uh, this is a image portraying the west wind, the wind that comes across Hollyburn, comes across uh, the North Shore Mountains. Um, that wind is Tel Tewit. It is a sort of a gentle, happy wind when it comes across uh, the mountains. It is uh, a nice warm wind. One of my dancers and uh, one of the dances that we do to uh, come, I say pay tribute to um, Takaya the wolf. And I thought this was a good image. Um, we have, uh, nowadays we have, um, we have brought our songs to another place where some of them have been re, uh, reimagined and um, placed into um, music, uh, music form on paper. And the songs are now played by a 90 piece orchestra, uh, West Vancouver Youth Orchestra and other, other orchestras around have picked up some of these songs that we, that we do. And I thought I'd show the image of the wolf, wolf being one of those songs. This is a, um, a glimpse of our war canoes. And these are the uh, women's uh, six, they call it six man, I think it's a women's, six man uh, canoe. And um, they go about five miles. This area is uh, down by Ambleside. Swaywe is our word for that area. And uh, the races are held in the month of July where other uh, villages will come and um, camp for the weekend and we bust out our canoes and race each other. And uh, finally, here we are, our dance group again, uh, demonstrating a bit of protocol in uh, welcoming you to the territory and um, praying that you have a um, successful visit, a good visit. And then here's our canoes over here, our paddles to the side. Thought you'd like to see that. So that kind of gives you an idea of what our canoes look like and, um, and kind of uh, what we do when we're, when we're out on the water. And uh, once we become a part of uh, visiting and being on the water and journeying and everything that's involved with uh, canoe journeys, we say that once, we are, once we're on a journey, we're on that journey forever. The journey never ends. And it is a very good way to, to carry ourselves while we're going through life and how we conduct ourselves. Um, we are given good teachings through being on, on one of these journeys. OCM. Chen Kwan Man Tomi, Uncle Haichka, OCM. How are? I am so grateful that you shared your knowledge with us tonight. I'm so honored that you came and you brought so much with your stories of um, canoeing and the culture. Um, you're a wealth of knowledge and I know that there's so much more to share. And we have time for two questions only. So I'll answer a question and uncle, I, somebody wants to ask you which canoe was more fun to paddle, the outrigger in Hawaii or the Coast Salish racing canoe? Well, they're very different. Um, they have very different uh, characteristics to begin with. The outriggers um, are, um, they, they were a lot of fun, but they'd also, we'd have to re-rig them in order to sail them. And then we'd have to re-rig them again um, to surf them, meaning that that banana thing that you see on the side of an outrigger canoe, which is called an ama, uh, is usually put over to the other side. It's usually on the left side, we put it on the right, right side to put on a trampoline for sailing. Also for surfing the canoes, uh, we use that banana to bury into the, bury it into the, into the wave. 
that, that was a lot of fun. That was a different kind of fun. The bigger canoes, they all have their own, I guess, uh, brand flavor of fun. Uh, the war canoes, very enjoyable, but very hard work. <laughs> Same as the outriggers. The outriggers, very enjoyable, but uh, when we uh, use them in competition, um, they, they can become very hard to paddle. The uh, ocean going canoes, um, I've had good fun with them uh, in that uh, occasionally we get to sail them, hoist a sail, and had, had a bit of fun when the Hawaiians were here uh, because Hawaiians are sailors, they know how to sail. And uh, they um, brought us to a place that we learned uh, a couple of things about how we could use our canoes using Hawaiians to sail them. <laughs> so there was, uh, it was, they have their own brand of uh, enjoyment. Um, I can't really say one is better than the other. And um, there's also a couple of canoes that I have not been on yet. So I'm looking forward to that too. So they, there's, they're all enjoyable and um, one is not better than the other. They're, they're all good in their own right. And they all have their own way the, of, um, of being, uh, you know, to, to work those canoes, to operate them, to, um, to get them to function in a, in a very harmonious way. And they all take uh, their own style of um, preparation. So this, yeah, so they're all good. Hopefully that answered something. <laughs> Hanman told me, Osiam Haichka. Yes, that did answer. That's very good. I like that. So there was a question about um, about why the Haida paddled to Hawaii. Did they travel for adventure or for food? So my belief is that it was for an adventure. Uh, they they just knew that their canoes were very seaworthy, and they wanted to see where they how far they could go. They wanted to see what was over on the other side of the ocean. And so they filled their canoes with enough provisions and water and they started on their two month journey to go there and it, uh, they knew it was going to take two months to return. And um, they were very adventurous because there are stories of them traveling to Mexico and back as well as California and back as well. And along the way, they would uh, meet with other indigenous uh, nations and they would feast together and they would trade uh, items that they had created themselves because this was before European contact. Uh, they would uh, introduce foods to one another as well because it would be very different. So my, my belief is that the Haida ancestors were quite adventurous. Uh, there, was, there is plenty of food on Haida Gwaii, just so, so you know. Uh, there has always been a, a plenty of food on Haida Gwaii, with the exception of abalone. Um, uh, when I was a little girl growing up, I know this is kind of a side track from, from paddling and canoe culture, but it's something that came into my head and I just, I felt like I must share it. I, um, I used to eat abalone growing up. My dad was a fisherman and he brought a lot of traditional food home because we were very, very poor. And actually I never felt poor. I never went hungry. I never ever did because we had a lot of fish to eat. We had a lot of shellfish to eat. We had other store-bought store, store -bought meat as well, but we had deer meat, uh, we ate geese. I grew up eating a very traditional diet. Um, my mother might not like me to say this, but I'm so grateful that we had fish almost every day because it fed my brain, it fed my body, it made my body strong. And, um, but the exception I'm thinking of lately I have not tasted abalone since I was a little girl. It used to be my favorite shellfish ever. And I have not tasted it because it's been over harvested by not Haida people, but by other people who have come into our areas. Uh, it's very sad to me because I have met some people who are a little older than I am and they've never tasted it in their lives. Um, 
that's a big sidetrack from canoe culture and paddling <laughs> because uh, I don't believe they actually paddled to get the abalone. They would have, or maybe they did, they had to dive. They would have to dive and they'd have to have a sharp knife to uh, pry the abalone off of the rocks. Anyway, I am so grateful to all of you for tuning in. Delung Wadlawan Afki Logung. I thank each and every one of you for being here. Delung Di Koyadang, I love you all. Delung Di Koyadagigang, I love you all forever. The Manan Kaingo, look after yourselves. How send along Kaing Sang. See you all again. Squintla, kiss. And now maybe Jen will come back on stage. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you so much, Uncle. How ah, Chen Kwan Man told me, Haichka, Osia. Thank you, Kung Jade. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. And for everyone out there, thank you all so much for joining us online tonight. Thank you, Elder Bob Baker, for generously sharing your knowledge, songs, and stories. And thank you also to Jorge, who is in the background making this event run very smoothly. We are going to share a link to a feedback form in the chat, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about this program. Your feedback is very important to us so that we can keep improving our programs in this new virtual space. So we'll put the link in there for you to see. And I also want to tell you about Kangju Day's next event for adults. We have a lunchtime program on Friday, April 9th from 12 to 1. And it is Discover Cedar Bark Weaving with Todd DeVries and Kung Jade. So we'd love to have you join us for that. If you have children in your life, Kung Jade is also doing a storytelling workshop for kids on Mondays and spring break. And that one is for children in grades four to seven. It's called Trickster Tales and it's sure to be a great time. So that's it for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. We're going to keep the event open for a few more minutes, just in case you want to scroll up and click on some of those links that we shared. Thank you again. Thank you, Bob Baker. Thank you, Kung Jade. And we'll see you again soon. Bye.